right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Bidwell Mansion State Historic Park. Remotely, obviously, we're all doing this online. My name is Mike. I'm a guide here at the mansion. Um, Welcome to this webinar. We're going to be talking a little about some of the early Chinese immigrants to this area today. Uh, I see we've got about 29, oh, about 30 participants so far, so quite a few. Um, now, today is a webinar. Um, this is something that we like to do. Uh, it's similar to our usual school programs, though. Uh, this is something we do since we can't get everyone on those. We like to do a webinar and have everyone as well. Um, the only problem is there's a little bit of limited interactivity in this, which means that um, I can see you guys if you raise your hands, but that's about all I can do. I, can, uh, I can't really interact with you too much. So, um, but right now I'm gonna have you guys, um, if you guys can hear me, uh, ra raise your hands if you can hear me. Okay, excellent. So at least we can we can communicate a little bit with like that. So I know that you guys can hear me. Okay, excellent. Um, so uh, before we get started, uh, just to give you guys all a little little um, background on what we're doing today. Uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the early Chinese immigrants to this part of California. So very specifically, the city of Chico in Butte County, and. Um, even though we are specifically talking about this part of California, uh, this is a history that is that is similar in some ways to the history of Chinese immigrants all through the state of California, as well as in some ways all through the country. So uh, even if you guys are possibly from somewhere outside of Chico, some other part of California or some other part of the country even, uh, this history might still be a little relevant to you guys. Uh, you guys, it looks like my video camera is working, so hopefully you can see that the ma mansion right behind me, which is the Bidwell Mansion I mentioned earlier, you won't be looking at me too much longer because I'm going to be sharing my screen uh, to share with you some of the historic uh, photographs as well as images of Chinese artifacts from that era that we have here. And um, talking a little bit about that history, uh, both of the, both, you know, we're going to talk a little about you know, the Chinese immigrants, why they came here to California and specifically to Butte County, uh, what life was like for them here in those days, and a little about some of the, the troubles and challenges they face living here in America. So without further ado, I think we're going to get started. So one second, let me see if I can share my screen with you guys. Whoops. All right, so hopefully you guys, looks like we are sharing successfully. So let me get that out of the way. So first things off, let me just uh, make sure we all know the part of California we're talking about. So we've got a map of California here. You guys might be anywhere throughout the state, uh, but I am right here in Butte County, this blue area right here. And if you look a little closer at Butte County, you can see it looks a little like this. Uh, this is the city of Chico where I am and Oroville is our neighboring city. And both of those names are gonna come up a few times uh, through the story today. You can see that Oroville is right here on the banks of the Feather River, which we're also going to mention a few times. Uh, this is the mansion that uh, you might recognize from being right behind me. That's the Bidwell Mansion where I am right now. And I mention it because this is also going to be a player in the story today. We're going to hear uh, that name Bidwell a few times as we go forward because uh, the mansion, as well as the man who built it, uh, were also kind of connected to the history of Chinese immigrants in this area. And this is what the mansion looks like today. You can see it uh, hasn't changed that much, or at least we've tried to keep it as, same, as similar as possible. And when I talk about Bidwell, that's this guy here, uh, John Bidwell. So this is the guy that built the Bidwell Mansion. And again, I mentioned him because we'll see his name pop up a few times in this history. All right, but getting into the actual history of Chinese immigrants in this area. Uh, first of all, uh, we've got a chart here that just shows the number of Chinese immigrants in the United States in different years. You can see in 1850, there were about 3,000 uh, Chinese people living in the United States. Uh, 1860, about 10 years later, it's 34,000. And by 1870, it's 63,000. So you can see the numbers uh, really growing. Uh, starts around 1850 is when the very first immigrants start coming from China. So. You may be wondering what happened around that year that started in encouraging people from China to come to America. And uh, most of you probably have a guess on that. And uh, that would be the gold rush. 
which starts in 1849. Or specifically, 1848 is when gold is discovered, but news doesn't really start getting out to the next year. And by 1850, of course, it's in full swing. Uh, so the gold rush starts when this guy, John Sutter, who some of you have probably already heard of, if you're in fourth grade or over, you've probably studied his name when you're gold rush units. Uh, but John Sutter uh, hires a man named James Marshall to build him a sawmill on the American River. And as they're building that sawmill, they see something in the river, gets them very excited. And of course, that's gold. Uh, once there's news that there's gold in California, people start coming from all over the world to here to look for gold. And you can see these are some of the places where people were coming from. Uh, they're coming from Europe out of sort of the port of Harvey, France. They're coming from South America, Argentina, Chile, Peru, uh, from Australia, a place called the Sandwich Islands, which are still around. We call them Hawaii now. And uh, of course, a lot of people coming from China, right out of the port of Hong Kong. Most of the early Chinese immigrants in this area came from this area in China, uh, the province of Kwangtung in the south, where you can see the port of Hong Kong is located. And um, there were a few things happening at this time that were encouraging people to uh, emigrate out of China. There were some uh, wars and natural disasters going on. Uh, so a lot of people were looking to leave and find some place a little more safe or secure where they might be able to live in peace. And so a lot of people were leaving to uh, emigrate to uh, Indonesia at that time for a tin rush, and others were going to Hawaii to uh, get involved in the sandalwood trade, which was big at the time. But a lot of people heard about there being gold in California. And in fact, uh, California was known as Gold Mountain in China because there were so many stories about all the gold here. So a lot of people thought that sounds like a pretty good thing to try out. Maybe you can go to California, try our luck there and maybe even get rich. Now this guy, uh, John Bidwell, was already in California at that point. Uh, he was actually friends with John Sutter. So he's one of the first guys to find out there's gold here. And uh, he decides, well, if there's gold on the American River, there's probably gold on other rivers here in California, too. In fact, there's probably gold on the Feather River, which is that river up in uh, my area, you can see. Uh, so John Bidwell actually prospects for gold right around here on the middle fork of the Feather River. And he's pretty successful. He actually does find gold there. And news gets out that there's gold on the Feather River, and of course, Lots of people start moving this area, hoping to find gold here. You can see this is what the Feather River looks like today. Pretty typical river. And about 150 years ago during the gold rush, looked a little more like this. So this is a painting of the Feather River and its gold rush days. And you can see after they found gold there, uh, lots of people start moving this area, it becomes a major gold rush hub for Northern California. And uh, people start building, you know, houses, businesses along the river. Uh, so a boom town grows up here called Bidwell Bar. And um, Bidwell Bar isn't around anymore because uh, after the gold rush ended, most people moved away. This kind of became a ghost town. Eventually, when they dammed up the Feather River to create Lake Oroville, this whole area flooded. So all these ruined buildings are now just under the lake. Occasionally, if the water goes down low enough in the summertime, you could still see, you know, sometimes the roof sticking out, but uh, you can't really go up here and visit Bidwell Bar anymore, not unless you want to go scuba diving. Now, <clears throat> uh, people from all over the world are coming to this part of California to try their luck in gold prospecting. And you can see this is a photo from those days with some of the miners who would have been here. Uh, you can see there's some miners here, uh, probably American ones here, as well as some Chinese miners too. And uh, when John Bidwell is prospecting here, he does mention in a letter to some friends that he sees people from all over the world. Uh, mentions that there are people from Europe, from Mexico, all over the United States, and lots of people from China. And uh, some of the Chinese miners who came to this area were fairly successful. Um, a lot of them had been uh, tin miners back in China, so they knew a little bit about uh, prospecting for ores. So some of them were able to use that knowledge uh, to help them. And uh, you know, some were fairly successful, others not so much. There is always a little bit of luck involved in gold prospecting. Uh, but at the height of the gold rush, there are about 16 different Chinese mining camps all up and down the banks of the Feather River. 
And in fact, uh, around this time, uh, we had the second densest Chinese population in the entire country. About 20% of the population of Butte County was Chinese. So very large Chinese population here in those days. And we actually have some uh, historic photos from those mining camps. Uh, this right here is a, a cook who worked in one of the Chinese mining camps that was on the Feather River. So this fellow would usually be back at camp uh, cooking for some of his colleagues who would be out on the river prospecting during the daytime. And you can actually see some of the, uh, some of the more permanent structures uh, that were part of the mining camps uh, here. These, these uh, photos are a little bit later um, after they've kind of been uh, mostly abandoned, but you can see what they used to look like. These, um, these homes were, you know, uh, a little bit thrown together. Most people who um, came to prospect here didn't expect to stay here very long. They were hoping they'd, you know, strike it rich pretty quickly and be able to move someplace better. But you can see what some of the uh, Chinese mining camps used to look like in this area. Now, um, we often talk about uh, the uh, Chinese immigrants who came here uh, during the gold rush. Uh, we don't very often talk about um, their lives after the gold rush. And that's something that I think is really interesting, especially in this part of California. Uh, when the gold rush starts to wind down, uh, most people move away. Um, you know, the same is true for a lot of the Chinese miners who came here. Many of them returned to China, uh, but a few of them decided to stay here in this area and see what life would be like for them here in America. And uh, most of them move into the local cities, Chico and Oroville. Uh, they start their own uh, businesses, their own farms. Um, and some of them, and many of them get jobs here. Uh, this particular photograph, I think is very interesting. This is a photo of one of the farms in the area. This was actually a photo taken on John Bidwell's farm. Now, John Bidwell was fairly successful during the gold rush and he um, was able to use his gold rush money to buy most of the land in this area, which he used to create a farm. Uh, John had a farm, which we call an experimental farm, which just means he really didn't know it was gonna grow here. Um, in those days, not a lot of people were farming in California. There was cattle ranching and people were growing winter wheat. But other than that, uh, not, a lot of, not a lot of agriculture. So it was on this farm in Chico that uh, they really started to experiment with different kinds of crops to see what would really thrive in California climate. And um, this photograph shows some of the uh, great vineyards that were on uh, John Bidwell's farm. And you can see some of the workers here. Uh, these are all Chinese workers. Now, John had about 500 workers on his farm. About half of them were Chinese. And uh, they worked at various parts of the farm. They were in his orchard, his dairy, his garden sections, uh, many of them growing uh, nuts and fruits here. Uh, and in fact, the foreman or the head worker on John's farm was a man named Ah uh, Louie. And Ah uh, Louie, uh, had come from China during the gold rush. You know, he'd hoped to make it big uh, in gold mining. Um, after the gold rush, he decided to stay here in Butte County and he got a job on John's farm. And eventually he is, uh, he's one of the top workers on the farm. And um, Ah Louie had actually been a farmer back in China. His family had uh, been fruit farmers. They'd grown peaches, plums, and persimmons for generations. Those were uh, uh, Chinese specialty crops in those days. And he brought that knowledge with him here. And he was really the one who was able to start getting those fruits cultivated here in California. So um, those are still things that we grow here today. In fact, um, you know, California is probably one of the top fruit producers in the world. So very big deal for us. Um, and a lot of that is because of the knowledge that Ah Lui and other uh, Chinese workers brought with them here to California. Um, so I've got, and this is another person who worked here. Uh, this is a man named Seng. And uh, Seng, uh, didn't work on the farm. He actually worked inside the Bidwell mansion behind me. So Seng was uh, the cook for John and his wife, Annie. Uh, so his job was he did all the cooking in the house. He would do cleaning, shopping, uh, household errands as well. And uh, this photograph is a portrait that Seng had taken 
uh, after he'd been living in Chico for a little while. And a couple interesting things. Uh, you can see at the bottom here, that's the name of the photographer, H.H. Fry here in Chico. Um, but what's more interesting, I think, is you can see that Seng, uh, now he's been living in Chico for a couple years when this portrait is taken, uh, but he's still dressed in traditional Chinese clothing. He's still got a traditional Chinese haircut. Um, he's into holding some interesting things here. You can see he's got a fan as well as this little um, ledger book, which he's kind of got the, the cover folded around backwards on. So these are important because um, these are very telling in uh, Chinese iconography. The fan is a symbol of status. So Seng was holding this to you know, show off that he's kind of an important guy. Um, he's, and the ledger book is a way to show that you're literate. So this is a very quick way to kind of show that Seng was able to read something that he was obviously very proud of. Um, so he's telling us a little about himself in this photo. Um, and you can see that even though he has been living in America for a little while, he's still retaining a lot of his Chinese culture. Uh, he's still dressing in the traditional way, uh, having Chinese objects here. And um, that is something that we see a lot when we look at the early Chinese immigrants to this area. It's a very interesting time when you're really seeing uh, people who live in America and people from China um, meeting for the very first time. Uh, so these very different cultures really coming together and uh, interacting in some interesting ways. Uh, you can see that uh, many of the Chinese immigrants, you know, uh, wanted to retain uh, their own culture when they came here, but also in some ways you can see them adapting to life in America. Um, now, many of the early Chinese immigrants in Chico um, lived in areas that we called uh, Chinatowns. And those are just neighborhoods that have large Chinese populations. There were two Chinatown areas in Chico. Um, one of them was on a street called Flume Street. We've got a, a, a modern Google's map uh, image of Flume Street here, though if you're from outside of Chico, that might not mean too much to you. But this is what Flume Street here looks like today. Pretty typical city street. The other Chinatown area was on an area we call Cherry Street, which looks like this today. So again, pretty typical city street. But this is what Cherry Street looked like about 150 years ago. So very different. And if you look at this photo, you can see a couple things. All the signs here are in Chinese. Um, you can see that uh, these people are selling uh, sort of vegetables here, ducks as well. Uh, they're dressed, some of them are dressed in traditional Chinese clothing, like these two fellows here. This guy here is a little more uh, American style. So you can see that he's uh, adapting some of the clothing styles that were common in America at the time. So again, you're seeing kind of a, a confluence of different cultures here. Um, now, this is a photo, again, from uh, Chico's Chinatown area about 150 years ago. And this is the old Chico Chinese temple. And uh, this is something that I think is really interesting because, um, you know, when people move to a new place, they usually bring their religion with them. So uh, they'll be building churches, synagogues, mosques, uh, all sorts of things. And uh, a lot of the, the early Chinese immigrants of this area were, weren't any different. They brought their faith with them as well. Uh, and this is where people would generally come to practice that faith. Uh, you can see right here in front of the building, we have this, uh, this big dragon puppet, which is something that would have been used in celebrations like the Lunar New Year Parade. Uh, we celebrated that just, just last month, I believe. So uh, some of you, if you're in, uh, in some of the larger cities uh, like Los Angeles or San Francisco, you might have been able to attend or at least see some of the celebrations that happened. Uh, this would be a typical sort of thing. You have the dragon dance in that. But inside the temple uh, kind of looked like this. As you can see, there's some uh, signage up here as well as the, uh, the altar that would have been here. Um, the, uh, the early Chinese immigrants of this area mostly practiced a form of ancestor veneration. So uh, this is a place they would have come to you know, speak with their ancestors, uh, possibly petition them for good luck or just uh, do prayers for them, uh, leave offerings. It's very similar to uh, things that many people still do today. If you have like a little altar or a, um, a shrine in your own home, you might have pictures of your grandparents or great grandparents, kind of remember your ancestors. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the kids that we talk to during the program still have family shrines like that today. Now, the Chico Chinese temple, unfortunately, is no longer with us. Uh, but 
Oroville also had a large Chinese population and their Chinese temple is still around. Uh, this is what it looks like today. It is a museum. So uh, once COVID is over, I mean, they're closed right now, obviously for uh, safety, but once COVID is over and we can still all move freely again, that's something that might be worth checking out if any of you all here in this part of California. This is what the inside of the, uh, the Oroville temple looks like. And you can see it's very similar to the Chinese, uh, Chico Chinese temple as well. Uh, now this is, <clears throat> This, this is a photograph that we have, uh, which is really good because uh, we do have some photos of, um, you know, the, uh, the Chinese immigrants area. Many of them uh, are taken during Chinese New Year celebrations because this is a time when uh, this was a very big deal for this town. Um, the, um, we have a lot of information about this because people talk about it a lot. It's mentioned in local newspapers. Uh, people talk about it in letters and diaries. Uh, this is probably one of the big um, events of the year, uh, not just for the Chinese population in this town, but also for others as well. You can see that people would come out to uh, actually enjoy these celebrations. Before um, I show you the actual parade though, uh, this is a little bit of the prep that happened before the parade. It's hard to see much in this photo because people have been setting off uh, fireworks. So there's all this smoke and the uh, photo has been a little damaged here. But you can see back here, some of the signs and banners that people would have been uh, using during the parade. Uh, right here, I believe actually, uh, you can see that banner right there is right here. The dragon that was right in front of the uh, temple, you can kind of see it there, that scaled pattern. Uh, also interesting that there seems to be an American flag among the banners, which is kind of unusual. Definitely not something that you would see in a traditional Chinese New Year's parade. Uh, we suspect maybe this again might be kind of a, a combination of American and Chinese styles that might have happened here in Chico, but very, very interesting right there. Uh, you can see the actual parade as it goes down uh, Main Street here in Chico. Uh, this is kind of, kind of an interesting thing. Uh, obviously, we've got a lot of people in the parade, but also people just showing up to watch. Uh, everyone, this is like a big uh, deal in this town. Everyone wants to come out and see uh, what's going on. And in fact, right here, you can see this is the same parade from the first photo going past uh, a, a house we still have here in town. This is the Stansbury house, which is uh, where the town doctor used to live. And um, he actually wrote in his diary about this parade, mentioning that uh, this was probably one of the highlights of the year, brought a little bit of uh, interest to this boring uh, valley town, which are his words, not mine. I guess he thought Chico was a little dull otherwise. Um, now, I did mention that we would be talking a little bit about that house behind me. And um, the reason for that is I mentioned that the guy who lived here, John Bidwell, did have a connection with the local Chinese community here. And it's a very interesting one, I think. It's very, uh, it's very unusual. In some ways, it's kind of complicated. Uh, John was a large employer of Chinese workers here. Like I said, about half his workforce was Chinese. He was the single largest employer of Chinese workers in this county. And um, in some ways, John was uh, seen as uh, a friend to the Chinese community. We know that uh, when there was anti-Chinese violence in this area, he did stand against it. He wrote editorials for the local paper, as well as uh, offering uh, money rewards for people that, um, to catch people who were perpetrating violence. And we know that when uh, there were uh, there were threats against his workers, he did arm them so that they could defend themselves if it came to that. Other than that, uh, we know that when there, were, there was flooding on the Sacramento River, which actually threatened some Chinese communities out there, John was one of the people who did send relief. But on the other hand, um, we also know that um, John, uh, even though half his workers were Chinese and they were very responsible for his success as a farmer here, he only paid them about half of what he paid uh, white workers. And that was typical for the day, uh, but still, not, to, not that that excuses it, uh, but it is something to kind of keep in mind when we talk about John's relationship with the Chinese here, something that's a little complicated. Um, now I'll also mention that um, John was a collector of Chinese art. Many of the uh, art pieces that he has or had were gifts from the local Chinese community, possibly some of them from his workers or other people who lived here. Um, and we still have some of them today, which is kind of fortunate. So. I'll actually show you some photos inside the mansion and we can actually see some of those items. 
Now, this is a photo taken about 100 years ago. And this is what the inside of the Beetle Mansion looked like back then. There are a couple odd things here. <laughs> you can see that there's this person here by the front door. That's John's wife, Annie. There's all this uh, foliage up here. On special occasions, they would put uh, uh, trellises with flowers up. Uh, so that was something they did kind of uh, as a fancy thing. They've also got this taxidermy collection with a swan in it. But I wanted to show you some of the uh, piece of Chinese art that we have in the house. And there are two in this photograph. One is this uh, lantern right here in the doorway. Uh, this is an item that uh, John received as a gift. Uh, the person who gave it to him told him to hang it in the doorway. Uh, so that's probably why it's hanging right here. Uh, that was for good luck. So that's probably why they had it right there. Unfortunately, we don't have that anymore. We're not sure what happened to that lantern. Um, after John and his wife died, it was probably willed away to a relative and then just kind of disappeared, which is really unfortunate. But there is another item in this photograph that we do still have. It's a little harder to see, so I'm gonna point it out. And that is this vase right here by the front door. And I've got a photo uh, of what it looks like now. So this is that vase up close. We call it the chrysanthemum vase because of all those flowers on it. And it's about three feet tall. So this is a big vase. And this vase was a gift that John's wife, Annie, received from her mother. And her mother had actually gotten this as a gift from the very first Chinese ambassador to the United States. So this was a very, uh, very important item for her. Um, it's kind of interesting because um, it's, a, it's kind of a weird combination of styles. The fluting is a little Chinese style. The figures sometimes people say are a slightly more Japanese style. So um, definitely some different influences on this. Um, on the very bottom of the vase, on the base, there is a stamp that says uh, Fat Plate Mountain in Chinese characters. Uh, we're, not sh we're not sure what that refers to. Nobody's ever been able to figure it out, but we assume that's probably uh, where the artist was from who made this vase. And this face, I think, is kind of telling because um, I mentioned that um, when there was anti-Chinese violence in this town, uh, John was a pretty big opponent of that. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, um, there was a large anti-Chinese movement here in Butte County. Um, there are a lot of people who didn't like the Chinese. They thought, you know, they look different. They have a different language, different way of dressing. Uh, there were people who just wanted to get rid of them because of that. And one of these groups actually uh, sent a delegation to meet with John and try to convince him to fire all his Chinese workers. And uh, uh, John really didn't like that. He didn't like being pushed around. So he was pretty adamant about keeping his workers here. But the interesting thing, I think, is when I read about this meeting, this vase, the chrysanthemum vase, was right here by the front door. So when these guys came to meet with John, that's something that I think would have been sending a pretty strong message about you know, John's uh, uh, beliefs on the subject. So that's something interesting I always like to think about. Now, that's not the only item, though. We still have a couple other um, pieces of Chinese artwork that I like to mention. This is the library inside the Bidwell Mansion. And a, cute, a couple of things here. One thing I'll point out is right here on the top of the uh, bookcase, there's this large vase. This is another gift to John. This was actually from Chinese exchange students who were attending a college at uh, Cal State Chico, which is the local college here in the town of Chico. Um, we also have a couple other items. There's this fire screen right here, and there's this tapestry over here, which I'll show you a little bit up close. Uh, this fire screen, you can see, has a, a Chinese dragon on it. Um, when the fire's going, uh, this would be placed in front of the fireplace to prevent embers from falling out and accidentally setting the carpet on fire, which, of course, you wouldn't want to do. Supposedly, because of the gold thread, that that dragon will glow uh, when a fire is going, though uh, we have the fireplace blocked off to keep out bats, so we can't actually have any fires going, so we can't see that one in action, unfortunately. This item is a good luck Chinese tapestry, and this was another gift uh, to John. A couple interesting things about this one. Um, you can actually see why it was considered such good luck. Uh, first of all, it's red 
which is a, a lucky color in Chinese culture. Uh, but a couple other things, you can see there's this, uh, this lion in the center, which would have been kind of a symbol of protection. There's also these kind of wispy things up here. They look like clouds of smoke, at least that's what I thought they were for a while, but these are actually bats. And bats are considered uh, a symbol of good luck in China. So you would have that on here as well. Finally, you'll notice all these little kind of reflective uh, buttons all over this tapestry. And what those are for is those are supposed to scare away evil spirits. Because in Chinese culture, uh, evil spirits are thought to be very ugly. So if they see their own reflections, they'll get frightened and go away. So a very lucky thing to have in your house. And that's probably why John would have had it here in his library. Now, um, I've talked a little bit about some of the um, uh, some of the more positive aspects of uh, life here back uh, during those days for uh, for some of the Chinese immigrants, but I kind of hinted to the fact that it wasn't always it was wasn't always easy that there was a large anti Chinese movement, uh, people who. Um, hated the Chinese here, mostly for racist reasons, and wanted to get rid of them. Uh, now, those people, there were multiple attacks here on uh, the Chinese population in Chico. Uh, they actually were a few arson attacks. People tried to burn down uh, Chico's Chinatown area. In fact, a few times people tried to burn down uh, the Boodle Mansion as well, because John was an employer of Chinese people. And it wasn't just uh, uh, fire attacks. There were actually uh, attacks on individual Chinese people as well. Uh, there were several murders that happened here. There was one uh, very famous instance that happened here called the Lem Ranch murders, where there were several Chinese people who were working on uh, a farm owned by a guy named Lem. And uh, in the middle of the night, some, um, uh, some guys broke in and uh, shot them. Uh, one of them, was able to survive the attack, a man named Wo Ah Lin. And Wo Ah Lin was able to uh, get the word out the next day and um, go for help. And uh, once news gets out about this, it, it, everyone in Chico's pretty, it gets, people get pretty upset. Um, and John was actually, actually suspected that he might have an idea about who the murderers were because people had been sending him letters. They'd been sending him death threats because he had Chinese workers here. Uh, so John went to the post office and he told the guy working the post office, like, look, I've been getting these letters. Uh, if you see anyone drop these letter, anything off that looks like this, uh, let me know. The postal clerk did. Uh, they caught this guy who uh, basically spilled the beans because he had been part of the anti-Chinese movement here. And that's how they were able to catch the, uh, the murderers. Uh, they actually ended up going down to San Quentin for a little while. Um, but even so, um, this still remained a very dangerous place uh, for Chinese people in those days. And eventually, most of the Chinese people in this area decided that it was too dangerous here. So most of them moved away. Uh, many of them moved to Los Angeles or San Francisco. Uh, some moved up to Canada because uh, by the 1920s, there's uh, some railroad construction going on there. Um, many of them moved back to China. So um, by, the, uh, by the 1950s, this photo here shows you what Chico's Chinatown area looked like. Most of the buildings have been knocked down by this. And the only ones that's left have basically been abandoned. You can see uh, there's one, just one left there. And even that building is gone now. I showed you some photos earlier of what these parts of Chico look like now. And there's, there's nothing to really indicate uh, that there used to be a very large and vibrant Chinese community in this town. Um, it's very unfortunate because um, you know, today in Chico, you know, we do have a lot of people um, you know, from China. We have a lot of Chinese Americans and people from all over as well. Uh, but they're all more recent arrivals. Uh, we don't have anyone who's a descendant of the original Chinese population that came here during the gold rush. And uh, it's really unfortunate, I think, um, you know, that we don't have a lot of that history now. Uh, we have a lot of historical monuments, you know, like, you know, the Bidwell Mansion, and tell us about like John's history, but very few about the Chinese population here. And, you know, you might want to, might, might reflect a little on why that is and whose story gets told in history. Um, but uh, that is why we like to do programs like this. So at least we can remember a little bit about uh, what life was like back then and some of the history that we used to have here. 
Uh, now that's that's about all the time we have for us today. Usually we would, we would take some time for questions, but unfortunately with the webinar format, we can't really do that. Um, but if you guys have any uh, other interest in learning about uh, Chico or Bidwell Mansion or this area, you can always check out our Facebook where Bidwell Mansion State Historic Park there, uh, or else just uh, check out the State Park's website. Other than that, hopefully we'll be reopening sooner or later. And uh, in that case, if any of you guys ever happen to be up in the Chico or Butte County area, feel free to drop by and say hello or give us a visit. Otherwise, I hope you guys all have a good rest of the day. And thanks so much for joining us today and visiting us remotely for Bidwell Mansion. Whoops. All right. Bye. <laughs>